We've talked on several times before about the OECD's comparative turn, and, and if we haven't talked about it before, I'm shocked. Um, it's a really interesting, uh, it's actually a chapter in an edited book that Martins, uh, Crystal Martins and a couple of others did in 2007. And it, the Martins perspective is, I think, a really interesting one. It looks at how the OECD in particular uh, changed its approach to education and education uh, involvement or reform or decision making or data gathering or whatever you want to say. And it, it's indicative of the way that international organizations in general uh, are influencing governance and policy making uh, re related to national education systems. And what Martins argues is that the OECD changed its approach. Uh, whereas in the past it focused on each state individually, acknowledging differences and idiosyncrasies, it now decisively compares states with each other and against standardized criteria. Now that is a really important uh, point, quite frankly. right? It now, whereas once it focused on each state individually, acknowledging differences and idiosyncrasies, it now decisively compares them and against some sort of standardized criteria. That is a very big shift from one that is responsive to the needs of the member states or the organizations, I'm sorry, or the, the governments, the nation states that are affiliated with the organizations to one where the organization itself, the international organization, in this case OECD, is actually calling the shots. Now it leads us to a big question. Why does direct comparison put states under greater pressure to reform their systems? And quite frankly, um, there has been a lot more activity related to education since the OECD uh, shifted their perspective on education, uh, shifted their approach to education, installed the Program for International Student Assessment, uh, PISA, uh, TESS, and started using that information as a way to, to quite frankly, rank and compare each other against, uh, against each other, as well as an, against some uh, standardized criteria in terms of um, like average scores and basic competencies in particular areas. So why does that? Why does direct comparison put states under greater pressure to reform their systems? Why aren't states always trying to reform their systems? Why is there something about pressure from an international organization which supposedly is there to support the states? What is it about that pressure that causes action? Well, it's a big question and there are a lot of different answers to it. Uh, so we can take a step back and we can start by saying, well, why do we perform comparative analyses at all? There are a lot of different ways you can think about it. Uh, there's a power way uh, where you could think about, or a more critical way, where you could think about we, we perform comparative analyses because it reproduces inequalities and it's driven by uh, standards that are set by those nation states or governments or entities or whomever that is in power that dominates and wants to retain that dominant position. And so comparative analyses are a way in which to establish and reestablish and over and over and over reestablish and reproduce the dominant uh, subordinate structure that exists. All right, that, that actually is a very good uh, explanation. Um, another one would be a more rationalist explanation where rankings and ratings reduce transaction and information costs. In other words, the, the argument is that we compare because when we see what another system has done, or when we can see what one system that looks similar in other sorts of ways, context or development level or uh, political regime or whatever, we can see when something happens in one of those systems, what it might look like in our own system or in a like system. And that way we don't actually have to try it out ourselves. We, we, it reduces some of the uh, transaction information costs because the, the uh, initiative or the program or the reform or whatever has already been implemented and tried somewhere else and so it's a way to simply uh, reduce the the cost of being involved another way is to think about it from an institutionalist perspective which would suggest a much less active approach than either the rationalist or the conflict uh, 
uh, or critical approach. An institutionalist approach would simply suggest that there's a diffusion of a specific practice or mode which influences the behavior of actors and establishes normative criteria for appropriate behavior. It's very innocuous sounding. And the critique of the institutionalist approach would be either that, no, 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 it's not just diffusion, right? We're doing this because it's an active way to reduce our transaction and information costs. Or you could say, no, 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 we're doing this because, uh, this says power and reproduction, because it provides us with a way to establish power and reproduce uh, inequality. And that is good for us because we're on top. And whereas the institutionalist approach says it establishes normative criteria for appropriate behavior. It's not quite as innocuous as it sounds. And let me just go with me for, with this for a little bit. The longer that we're involved in mass education systems, the longer that those become normative. We get used to them. Right? Yes, maybe they are reproducing power. Yes, maybe they are being used to reduce transaction information costs. But there's also an experience that goes along with mass education systems. There is also a structure that goes along with them. And there is also a set of shared expectations for every community that participates in them. No matter how much the, the system may vary in its implementation, the idea that they are doing mass education, to harken back to Benedict Anderson's imagined communities, gets established. That's a big deal. So, if we're performing comparative analyses, and we, we know that we've been doing this for a while, formally since the 1960s, uh, well, quantitatively since the 1960s on a mass scale, uh, formally much longer than that, much, much longer than that. So if we've been doing it this long, then comparative analysis becomes the normative criteria. That is the appropriate behavior. We do not tend to question it as much as we might have 10, 20, 50, 100 years ago, because we do it all the time, for whatever reason. Well, on page 54 of the OECD's comparative turn, Martin says, since rating and ranking activities by the OECD appear to be based on objective criteria, scientifically researched by experts, and presented in an easily accessible manner, it puts states under pressure to import and apply models for education which seem to have worked better in other countries instead of continuing on their own path. In other words, Martins is answering our question. Why perform comparative analyses at all? Why does direct comparison put states under greater pressure to reform their systems? Well, she says, because there is a comparative system out there and because it appears to be legitimate for scientific reasons, for normative reasons, for whatever reason. So let's break this down a little bit. Since rating and ranking activities by the OECD. All right, I just want to comment on the way this is worded. She is not talking about education development. She's not saying since education development activities by the OECD, OECD appear to blah, 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 blah. She's specifically talking about rating and ranking. The implication is, and I think it's a good one, is that the educational activities that the OECD and quite frankly many international organizations engage in is not meant to be developing education systems or in enhancing learning or improving teaching quality. It, the intention is to rate and rank. The intention, if I was going to go full bore cynical, is to win. And since those rating and ranking activities by the OECD, up, OECD appear to be based on, right? so she's making it very clear that what she's about to say is not established fact, but it's perception. It's legitimization. Appear to be based on objective criteria. This is the same old story about quantitative data. 
Now, I think anyone who's had a basic research class will know that both kinds, kinds of data, qualitative and quantitative, can be used in unethically, they can be used inappropriately, they can be used to uh, present situations that don't actually exist. You can, you can lie with data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative. But there is often an uh, appearance or a legitimacy for quantitative data that qualitative data doesn't necessarily have. And the quantitative data, because it is numbers-based, often has an aura of objectivity to it when we know that it doesn't necessarily have that inherently. It can be objective, just like qualitative data can have an objective component to it, although qualitative data is much more likely to be subjective. Right? But we know that that's a legitimate way of perceiving it. We know that these rating and ranking activities by the OECD appear to be scientifically researched by experts. Again, legitimacy. And presented in an easily accessible manner. What could be easier than a ranking? It goes one, two, three, four, five. We're all familiar with that. So it has this objectivity aura. It has the legitimacy of appearing to be scientifically researched by experts. And it's presented in an easily accessible manner. That's a win-win-win if you're looking for a way to influence governance and policy of education. Because of all these things, it puts states under pressure to import and apply models for education which seem to have worked better in other countries instead of continuing on their own path. All right. <clears throat> so it puts states under pressure to import and apply models. Here's where I would critique Martins a little bit about uh, her, her approach to governance. To import the models, yes. To apply the models, not necessarily. There are many examples of national education systems importing policies and training systems and sometimes whole schools, as in the UAE and Saudi Arabia with their Finnish schools. Um, but the application of those policies and those models, the application is much less uh, well, it doesn't happen quite as much. How about that? It, it, it's much less uh, a real, right? So when we talk about policy borrowing or uh, model importation, and there are certainly plenty of things you can read on that, and I'm sure you've already done some of that by uh, Phillips and, and others, uh, what they rarely talk about is the actual application of those models. They often talk about the gap between the, the model that's been imported and the actual application. The models themselves that are imported rarely are applied the way that they uh, are meant to be. Rarely. Right? Because there's so much influence from the local level. Now, why do they do this? Well, <clears throat> Martins is, is buying a little bit of the rationalist approach. Right? It worked better in another country, so it must work well for us. But I want to point out here that this, is, this, this statement is emphasizing an important thing. Governance of education systems and policy making is not about finding the best or the, the right approach. Well, maybe I should peel that back. I won't be quite as cynical. It can be. But there is a, an imperative in governance and policy making that there must be some sort of result. There must be some sort of effect, it must be measurable and observable, and it must be able to be used to sustain that policy and its implementation, or it will be tossed. Right? So when you're talking about governments, governance and policy related to education, we're often, if we think politically, often under pressure to show results quickly. And so this is why there's this constant turnover. This is why comparative education and comparative research and, and national level comparisons of education at all lead to this kind of importation and then re-importation over and over again. And that is the OECD's comparative term.